Hello, everyone, and welcome to another week of Mastering Dungeons. I am Sean Merwin here with my close friend, Teos Abadia. Teos. Uh, do you mean you're six feet away, friend? Yes, yes. <laughs> six feet away. Even if we're both, actually, if we're both vaccinated, uh, we can be together uh, as you're long up. as there's no other yeah. family involved. Uh, that that's my understanding uh, of the I, CDC rules that just came I, down today. Yeah, I commend you on your knowledge of them. I was reading them today, and I thought it was, they were all very interesting, but but not the subject for a podcast. No. Um, my close friend, I'm glad to be here. Hello, Sean. Hey. Uh, so news just keeps on coming, and as always happens, as soon as we end our uh, recording... <laughs> Or sometimes right in the middle of recording, some other big news drops, and that's exactly what happened last week. So let's get right into the news where we learned that two new names have been attached to the D&D movie. A couple of actual big names. Uh, Hugh Grant looks like he has been uh, cast to play the antagonist. And Sophia Lillis, um, a younger actress who has been in some very high-profile uh, Netflix things. Yeah, she was uh, great recently. in I Am Not Okay With This. That was, she's, she was really cool, uh, yeah, great acting, really neat. So. Yeah, I, I saw her in Uncle Frank, uh, which was you know, an interesting role uh, as well, and cool. just absolute stunningly well-acted part. So hopefully that's good. And you know, I've seen some people say, oh, Hugh Grant's involved, now I'm interested. Yeah, and, and 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 there were some guesses as to you know is he a Sarak? Is he, you know, yeah. <laughs> it looks like probably not, uh, <laughs> according to what the Hollywood Reporter says that he will play someone named Forge Fletcher. I mean, that's the nom de plume for a Sarak, if I recall my old Greyhawk lore. Uh, it, yeah, no. you think? No, yeah. I yeah I I see that and I see dwarf, but but Fletcher being an elf, I I don't know. And you can you can attach any name to this movie, and <laughs> it's not going to matter until words are on paper and scenes are on film, because yeah. it could it could go in any which direction. And I am trying to temper my enthusiasm. I'm trying to keep my expectations for what this could be steady, because I'm not. I don't want to go in expecting too much. I, I right. want to go in saying this is going to be a movie uh, <laughs> that that I, I hope I will enjoy. I'm not going to put too much stake in the D&D part of it. Because um, as we were discussing beforehand, you know, if we see D&D represented in the media in a certain way, as big fans, as players, as people who design the game, right? it's too easy to be let down by some inconsistencies with the reality that we know of the game. Yeah, that's a that's a great point because think of how awesome Stranger Things has been, even though it's constantly not, even when they're showing the game of D&D, not faithful to it, right? They'll mix right. additions and timelines. They will take wild, you know, Demogorgon isn't Demogorgon. It's some other type thing, you know, and right. the Mind Flayer doesn't quite line up with, you know, what the game book says. Like, and, and yet it's wonderful. Right. So it does not have to be faithful. You're totally right. It doesn't yeah. have to be that faithful production. As, as long as it be... captures the spirit of the game, yeah. which I think is what uh, people are most in love with, then I, I will be perfectly happy. Yeah, I mean, you know, like um, this is now with with the cast that's been uh, mentioned, Hugh Grant with Sophia Lillis, with Chris Pine, with Michelle Rodriguez, with Justice Smith, with Rege Jean Page, uh, this is now an exciting cast. Like they could be, this could be any movie, and you'd be like, "Oh, cool cast!" You know, maybe mm -hmm. I want to see it. And so now, you know, we've got the parts. So it's just the question of whether the script is going to be cool, and 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 the fascinating question of, you know, what is this going to be? Is it going to be they're all at an amusement park and they get dragged in? Is it going <laughs> to be? Uh, sometimes we're playing at a table and sometimes we switch to being in the game. Is it, you know, how are they going to tell this tale? Is it going to be like a Lord of the Rings epic thing? Is it going to be probably not like the first one, which is just sort of this weird romp, you know, like, I, I don't know. There's yeah. so many ways it could go and it's fascinating and exciting. Right. Right. And, and I could be happy with any of those. 
uh, right? Ninety yeah. percent of the games I play are are tragic comic. <laughs> <laughs> the tragedy being the comedy uh, that that's involved, as Teos knows uh, from my home group. Uh, so you know, I, I'm fine with with satire. I'm fine with campy. Uh, it just has to be done yeah. well, you know. So yeah. we'll uh, we'll we'll see what happens there. Go from movies to video games. Uh, Hidden Path Entertainment has announced that they are working on a third-person open-world fantasy role-playing game that will be taking place inside the Dungeons & Dragons franchise. So if you're looking for a sprawling open-world fantasy game, AAA, they're, they're saying, uh, yeah. let's get some uh, gaming on with Hidden Path Entertainment. Yeah, and they're announcing all these different positions for it, and Strix is behind it, uh, mm -hmm. who recently worked on, I th was it Candlekeep Mysteries? One of the I, books. Yeah, I think Candlekeep Mysteries she, she worked on. Yeah, so, um, you know, there's it's always nice when, when the company understands D&D, &D, uh, or has at least, you know, one person that understands D&D, &D, then that's, uh, that's very helpful, and RPGs too, right? So, in general, so that'll be interesting to see. If I were in the video game area, I'd be like, Ooh, I want this job. <laughs> this is, yeah, it's, it's actually, did, did she work on, no, she worked on uh, Ravenloft. The, oh, the, uh, Ravenloft. The Van Richten's yes. Guide to Ravenloft. Yep. That's so what it was. So that yeah. will be, uh, it'll be interesting to see. Obviously, they're in early stages here because development's just started. But, yeah. you know, hopefully a couple of years down the line when they're ready to start releasing some things, we will have a very fun game to play. Yeah, this ties into last week where we reported on all of the Wizards of the Coast amazing uh, growth and the change of strategy. And one of the things that was in there was a, a kind of strange quote about sort of increasing our tempo or something like I forget the exact words. Mm -hmm. But it was this sort of idea that made you wonder, well, are they going to just chuck more books at us? Or which I hope they don't. Or are they going to, you know, what does it mean? And maybe this is what they mean, which would be great if there are more expressions of the game, right? More. Mm -hmm books, comics, TV shows, uh, give me the D&D cartoon, give me more video game options, then that's great. I don't have to play all of them I'm, and I'm not being drowned in it. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't have to buy the D&D baloney, but I can see it on the shelf, right? Like, <laughs> I am all for that. Okay, we will. You know that's an actual product, right? It, I, yeah. We had it in Spain. We can do it again. <laughs> we can have D&D baloney. Come on, wizards. I will, uh, I will keep that uh, on my on the back burner of my D and D wish list, yeah. but uh, for those of, for those baloney fans out there who just need their D and D baloney, yeah. we will uh, we will say a prayer for you. Spanish speaking baloney, <laughs> Spanish speaking baloney, absolutely. <laughs> hey, Spanish speaking segues into our next news because newbie DM and yeah. UK Bertrand uh, put a screenshot up of the upcoming Candlekeep Mysteries book, and. We now know that coming back to the D and D side of Wizards of the Coast is Mr. James Wyatt. Yeah, he responded to this uh, capture of the, the the credits page, which had the development uh, design team, and it looks like he is now back on the team. And uh, awesome to see James Wyatt in the design department again. He has been a critical member of the team in the past. He's uh, he, he was a freelancer for a long, long time and then joined in 2000, worked on a lot of those early 3E adventures along with the primary authors. Um, so things like Forge of Fury and, and uh, Speaker and Dreams and all those. And then he worked on City of the Spider Queen, a uh, big part of the development team, along with Keith Baker and Bill Slavsek for Eberron. Mm -hmm. um, and often, you know, he's often in interviews talking about how the creation of Eberron came together. And then he was a big part of the design team for 4E. Um, and he had been a minister when he started writing Dungeon Magazine articles and became a freelancer. Yeah. Um, so he worked uh, to heavily revise the cosmology of Dungeons and Dragons. A lot of those effects are still very present today in, in the cosmology of 5e. Mm -hmm. Wrote a ton of really fun novels and a lot more. So um, and, and he had moved to Magic the Gathering, right? And he was there and sort of doing whenever Magic the Gathering would have like a free D&D &D Magic the Gathering crossover on the guild or uh, with the last two books that do crossovers. He's been a big part of those. So. Yep. Yeah. Uh, also, I've worked with him on a couple projects. Absolutely tremendous human being as well. Wonderful. And so, you know, it's it's great to see him coming back into the D&D &D world, which is not surprising with the news that we've been reporting on yeah. how D&D &D is growing and they're they're needing uh, all hands on deck 
as you right. as it were. Right. Uh, so we now know where Adam Bradford ended up. The one of the creators of D and D Beyond had departed recently, and we were waiting to see where he ended up. And where he ended up was a place called Demiplane, which is a web based RPG solution that gives free video and voice chat, shared journaling, uh, matchmaking, and quote more to come, according to uh, Adam and the Demiplane website. So yeah. you signed up for, uh, at Demiplane just to get a yeah. look at what it what it was. Yeah, it was it was uh, you know one of the things that's always interesting is this going to be a pain to get started, and it was super easy. Like it was, took me two seconds to make an account, validate the email, jump in, and get a quick tour. Uh, I liked everything I saw. It, it's it's clean, uh, nice interface, and it's, basically it's exactly what you described. Like you can say, I want to run a game of Lost Minds at Fandelver, and find players, or you can look and see, oh, there are some games going on. I want to join this particular game. Um, and there will be ways that you can charge and you can tip the DM or you can have a fee if you want. Um, so it has that whole matchmaking piece. Mm -hmm. It has built in video and chat all in there and, and, you know, campaign journals and things like that. So yeah, it'll be very interesting to see how this develops. Adam Bradford, you know, what he did was really help design what D and D beyond would be as an offering and to chart that development path. And he, he has those, it's clear if you watched any of his design and development um, uh, YouTube sessions that he would do or, or Twitch stream sessions that he would do, you know, he's that rare kind of project development manager that is really gifted at that. And so I, it'll be great to see what he does at Demiplane. Yeah, it, it, the, I mean, the question obviously is, is there a tabletop, uh, you know, thing component <laughs> coming because that's where a lot of people uh that's where a lot of people's games are right now yeah and, and will how there much, be content and... exactly will there be content will there be uh any coordination with w w wizards of the coast directly to bring yeah. in uh any of the similar things that dnd beyond had so you know great uh great landing place for him it was also uh founded by co-founded by a Center for the Dallas Cowboys, a Pro Bowl uh, center yeah. for the Dallas Cowboys who grew up in Madison, Wisconsin, went to the University of Wisconsin, ended up in Dallas, played for you know, six or seven years. And wow. He was a gamer. So, uh, so it doesn't just do role playing games, right? It does board games. And uh, I, I think that's, that's pretty cool. That is great. Yeah. Well, that's what I would do with my money if I had earned it that way. So, yep. Well, speaking of <laughs> earning money, uh, there has been a lot of notice of recent and past Kickstarters for the RPG section that went over a million dollars. Because last week we saw two of them that ended with over a million dollars in uh, Kickstarter backing. Yeah, the One Ring by Free League hit two million, 2.025 wow. million. Yeah. And Free League, Fria Liga from Sweden, Mm -hmm. um, has been just knocking it out of the park with these releases. You know, Alien is a fantastic system, and they've just had so many other systems. They are able to produce these often and extremely well, right? Mm -hmm. And so $2 million for the One Ring. And the One Ring has been a, an RPG that has been out, right. uh, and they, they kind of got the rights to, to do the next version of it, which is largely apparently supposed to be a lot like the previous version. Um, but One Ring was one of these things that like my friends would play. I've actually never played it, but my friends would play and say it's great. And then you'd try to get a game at Gen Con and there would be like one table sold out. Right. Just really under the radar. And so it's really amazing to see what they could do with a game that's been very quiet. It's always a big property, mm -hmm. Lord of the Rings. But to turn it into $2 million Kickstarter is a testament to, to how they understand the marketing game so yeah. very well. Yeah, marketing game and putting out great game after great game uh, also helps. Yeah. It does help. <laughs> and the other one that ended recently that made over a million dollars was The Seeker's Guide to Twisted Taverns, which ended at $1.65 million. And okay. this uh, is a fifth edition. Uh, I, I'm slightly involved in it, in the, in the fact that uh, Ghostfire Gaming is a, sort of a partner with Eldermancy um, yeah. in, on the publishing side. So... We will get to put all of this wonderful stuff together and Fantastic. shout out to, to the backers. Yep. 
Well, if you told me, Sean, that uh, 14 taverns uh, was going to get 1.65 million, I would have laughed. Mm -hmm. uh, I would have. I would have as well. <laughs> and I'm glad to to laugh now with joy that our hobby can support this, uh, which is cool. And and I, I it. it I'm constantly trying to learn about this industry, and this is a good example. You try to figure out exactly what did they do because this is so well done. What an, what a well executed Kickstarter to land yeah. at 1.65 million, yeah. and that causes us to look at you know kind of how this compares to previous ones. Uh, the, the the all time winner is MCDM Strongholds and Streaming with 2.12 million. You can argue that wasn't just tabletop, but but a lot of it was. Mm -hmm. And if you doubted that the tabletop part of that was significant. Uh, the Kingdoms and Warfare Kickstarter had 1.37 million. So, um, you know, those right there rank as the top and then the, the fourth on the all time list. We then have just below it at 1.37 million, the seventh C second edition that John Wick launched. Mm -hmm. And then the Humblewood campaign setting for 5e by Hitpoint Press, another company that's shown this ability to market really effectively, just over 1 million. Um, and then you have a bunch of other Kickstarters that have things like dice or software that may be associated with the area, but weren't primarily around role playing. Right. So it'll be an it'll be an interesting exercise to watch trends, to see how if this the two of the top five you know have or top four have just ended. So we'll see if this is a trend where we're going to see many more million dollar Kickstarters in the RPG realm. Or if this was sort of an aberration. Yeah. That'd be interesting. Oof. Yep. Uh, Jeremy Crawford got online to tell everyone about how feats interact with custom lineages and uh, not custom lineages, but what's the other thing? Yeah. Uh, custom custom lineages, origins. But not yeah. custom origin. Yeah. There you go. Do you want to explain the difference there and what Jeremy yeah, was talking about? You know, when I first saw it, it, it sort of sounded like, you know, if you make, if you customize your, your, what kind of race you are now, you don't qualify as an elf mechanically. And I saw a number of comments that kind of said like, wait, isn't the point of this to be sort of more inclusive? And then I said, okay, let me look at the two rules and what it is in, these are both in Tasha's in the same section. Mm -hmm. And the majority of Tasha's deals with customizing your origin. So you say, I'm an elf. I want to customize being an elf. Uh, instead of getting a bonus to dexterity, as it says in the player's handbook elf rules, I'm going to choose my attributes the way I want, and I'm going to choose the proficiencies I get, and that's customizing your origin. You are, in those cases, an elf. You have customized being an elf. Mm -hmm. So that's all normal and fine. But there is a sidebar that's in Chapter 1 of Tasha's in that same place where it talks about custom lineage. And this is chosen instead of a race such as elf or dwarf. Um, where you decide to create a humanoid in your way that you want it to be. And that could be because maybe you're a mix of elf and dwarf and you're neither, or you could be some totally new thing. And it gives you the rules for how to create that. And it does say that your type is humanoid. So mechanically, it's all very straightforward. You're not another thing, you are humanoid. Mm -hmm. So you don't qualify for things like elf or dwarf as a racial feat because you're, you're, you're just a humanoid, you know, you're... Mm -hmm. You're not one of those other members, even if you might describe yourself as belonging that, uh, you know, cosmetically. Right. So, so that's the difference. And he was okay. clarifying that that custom yeah. lineage, lineage will not qualify. So if you wanted to take some sort of racial feat, uh, you would want to customize your lineage, but not customize your origin. The opposite. Oh, the opposite. Okay. Customize you, your origin. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Not customize your lineage. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, cause, yeah, custom lineage is the I am a humanoid. Yep. I'm not a member of something else. And and you could describe yourself, you know, whatever way. I'm a, you know, aquatic mm -hmm. creature or whatever. Okay. And and that's how you do that. But so in that case, you don't qualify. But customizing origin, which was the majority of Tasha's chapter one deals with, that does qualify. Sweet. Yeah. Uh, Looking at the inside of the RPG publishing industry, we get something from Owen Casey Stevens in an article where he uh, looks at how when fans expect or ask or demand that a company do a specific thing may not be in the company's best interest. <laughs> uh, I, the, the name of the article is, Why Isn't Game Company Doing the Thing? Sean, why isn't Wizards of the Coast making Dark Sun? It's my favorite setting, and they would make millions of dollars if they would just make Dark Sun right now for me. You know what, Teos? 
You may be right, <laughs> uh, but you may be wrong. <laughs> and it, it surprises me that people need to hear this, but people need to hear this. Yeah. Because especially in hobbies or in businesses where there is a great deal of fan uh, buy-in, there's a great deal of fan love, everyone begins to think they're an expert on, on a subject. And I always turn it around on the person who's doing this and saying, well, you are a, you know, you run a machine at a factory. Would you want me to come in and tell you how to do your job? Uh, <laughs> well, it would make more sense if you just doubled the speed of the, the machine because you could get twice as much work done, right? right. It's makes it's obvious to me, uh, but yeah. I am not an expert in running that machine that you run. Right. So you have an expertise, you know, the ins <laughs> and outs. Uh, and when you turn it around on someone, they're like, well, okay, maybe. Uh, mm -hmm. But even getting that maybe is sometimes a, uh, it's, a hard. It, it's a hard thing. So, yeah. so what, what did, uh, what did Owen Stevens say? in this article. Well, he, yeah, he mirrors some of what you're saying. He says, you know, there, he breaks down the reasons for why that company that you're thinking of may not be doing that thing that you assume is a slam dunk. Slam dunk. And one is he just right out says this, you may actually be on a terrible idea. Mm -hmm. Like it may not work, right? right? Maybe the spell jammer box set really isn't a great idea. Um, or maybe it is. Uh, <laughs> also that companies know more for exactly what you're saying. They have information you don't, they have expertise. They've seen things that have failed in the past. They understand the cost angle in ways that you don't. They know what their current obligations are, their work capacity, warehousing issues, scheduling their unannounced projects, right? They understand all of that and how everything fits into it. And so any new consideration, they're able to weigh this against that inside information that they have, which you don't. Um, and even if they were to decide to do that thing, like maybe they agree, you know, the best thing in the world right now is the birthright campaign setting, making a comeback. Uh, many situations can come up that cause them to fail at executing on that without it ever being announced, right? So internally they go, you know what? Well, we're actually also releasing our mass combat rules. Those things would be too much of one thing. All right, let's delay our work on the birthright resurgence. Right. Um, and that's actually interesting because we can look at various examples in D&D's past and see that like there have been a number of times when D&D &D came really close to doing something between Magic the Gathering and D&D &D mm -hmm. and then pulled back, right? right? Or various settings or products that they were going to release and then they didn't because it was a little too close or they found a cost issue that made it not worth doing. So, you know, all of that uh, is really true historically with D&D, &D, which is the company you and I know best. Right. Um, and they point out that doing a thing always takes away from whatever you are doing with the company. You're always doing other things, too. So doing that thing takes away from those goals. And there can be reasons why you want to do those other things. So um, and the last one is that they can be actually working on it and just not able to say anything. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we've seen projects that have dragged on forever for all of all of those reasons. Maybe it's a legal issue maybe it's a, a marketing timing issue to have it sync up with something else that's going on inside or outside the company uh, all of those things um, can be brought to bear to change schedules or to change people's mindsets um, so it's always important yeah. to keep that in mind and, and if anyone knows the inner workings of a lot of different companies it's Owen Casey Stevens because he's you know been in the industry a long time and has worked with many different companies yeah, he really does. And, and he has a, a, a lovely way of sort of saying, you know, these truths about our industry and in ways that are that you can learn from, which is yep. great. So that's the news this week. Next, we will move on to talk about Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, the player side. So we have been going through each of the classes, talking about the optional features and their various subclasses. And we have made our way up to and found our way through the forest to talk about the ranger. The ranger- oh, hold me back, hold <laughs> me back, Sean. This is my class. You know, when I think of like, which class do you love? It's the ranger. You know what that means? I'm super opinionated. I'm like yes. the bad guy in that previous article. Like, let me tell you what the ranger should be. This is what so you should do. Hold yeah, me back. This was so interesting for me because this was probably the class that got the most flack after the, the publication of the player's handbook. So it was very interesting to see the changes that they would make through optional features to learn those lessons or to think 
that we can figure out what lessons that they learned uh, with their redesign choices. Yeah. And Teos is going to tell us all about them, <laughs> probably screaming into his mic. Uh, hopefully the spit guard <laughs> is up and, and we will be all set. So let's talk about the Ranger optional features. At first oh, let's level, talk about it, Sean. No, I'm, uh, so I'm going to be the measured voice of, of reason. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. So at first level, you get Deft Explorer, and and, and this is the first optional feature, right? We should back right. up, and so this is yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the first optional feature is Deft Explorer, um, which is going to replace the Natural Explorer. And I have a feeling this is going to be the class where we go back, spend more time going back to the original, than actually talking <laughs> about what's new. So Deft Explorer replaces Natural Explorer. So do you, would you like to? calmly yeah. talk us I'm through the so changes okay natural explorer is uh where you select it based on your favored terrain feature like forest you know jungle kind of thing and um arctic mountains and in that terrain you're you, when you're moving as a group so using the exploration rules it doesn't count uh it doesn't slow group travel to be in difficult terrain your group can't become lost. The folks who ran Tome of Annihilation probably know all about this. You can forage for twice the value, a number of kind of things like that. And the issue with it is that it can be so powerful, like the not getting lost is really a huge impact in an adventure like Tome of Annihilation, or it's completely useless. If you chose Desert and Arctic and you're playing Tome of Annihilation, this entire Natural Explorer feature does absolutely nothing for you all adventure long, all career long. Right. So it's a, it's a strange mechanical feature and it reflects a type of design from 5e that we often saw, which is a sort of very open play, uh, kind of more narrative. It's, it's not meaty little plus twos, plus ones. Right. It's it's more of the sort of bigger um, involvement in the gameplay. Mm -hmm. So what Deft Explorer then does is it makes this feature more useful in every situation and more mechanically concise. So you can actually see the benefit that you're getting from it. Yep. At least that is my opinion. So yep. let's let's talk it through. Uh, you are unsurpassed in exploring and surviving, both in the wilderness and in dealing with others in your travels. So you gain these benefits. At first level, you gain canny. You get to choose one of your skill proficiencies. Your skill proficiency uh, bonus is doubled for that ability. And you get to read, write, and speak two additional languages of your choice. Thoughts? Yeah, so it's, it's interesting. Um, it, I, I worry that it intrudes on the rogue a bit because you could choose stealth and now you're, you know, it's like expertise um, and you get two languages. So it's sort of like favorite enemy, but not favorite enemy at all. You know, it, it has that some of those bits being brought in, but mechanically, it's fine. It's cool. Okay. Uh, at sixth level, you get roving. Your walking speed increases by five, and you gain a climb speed and a swim speed equal to your walking speed. Ooh, I have thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me thoughts. So, this is actually, if, if you've run an underwater adventure, you know how strong this is. Or yeah. if you uh, often have climbing scenes, you know how big a deal this can be because normally you climb at half speed, and that's a strong way to kind of prevent people from moving around a map very quickly mm -hmm. is have to, things where they have to climb. Uh, so climbing at your normal speed is a big deal, but swimming, having a swim speed is tremendous because it means that you can now attack with any weapon and you don't have disadvantage where usually it's got to be like, you know, a crossbow or a spear. It's this, you know, a list of like five weapons that work underwater. Otherwise it's disadvantage. Mm -hmm. And as a ranger, I, I have a 20th level ranger uh, that, that fights at range. And it's terrible to have this bow that, you know, is disadvantaged all the time because there goes your souped up feats and all that. So right. this is huge. This is tremendous. And especially if you were to play in a campaign, like, you know, any kind of aquatic type campaign, ooh, this is instant. You desire this badly. Yep. yep. And at sixth level, that's, you know, it's, that's not really early in a campaign, but it's not late either. It's, right. it's useful in those specific situations. Uh, yeah, I, you know, how often do you end up swimming? Eh, it depends on the campaign. Yeah. Climbing can happen a lot more and, you yeah. know, not having to make those ability checks to, to climb also is, is 
can be quite quite a huge yeah and, and when thing. we think that you know this is all replacing we've just listed two of the three things that are replacing that sort of maybe it works maybe it doesn't group mm -hmm. travel type thing um, that, that's this is already a big boost i mean just if your speed increased by five that would already be pretty good but that's just a little bit and then you get this climbing swimming stuff so this is roving at six level is strong yep, yep. and at 10th level you get tireless as an action you can give yourself a number of temporary hit points equal to 1d8 plus your wisdom modifier uh, you can use this action a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus and you re get regain all those uses after a long rest in addition, whenever you finish a short rest, your exhaustion level, if any, is decreased by one. You um, know, mm -hmm. if I were editing this, I would have said, like, what if we just go with the exhaustion thing? That's fine. His exhaustion doesn't come up that often, but getting rid of it is certainly lovely when it does come up. Mm -hmm. But man, more ways to have temporary hit points. Is that what we needed? Like, this is Tasha's is like the darkness and temporary hit points. Everybody gets it book. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's, it's, we're, we're just getting into, we have a lot of source books out there now. Yeah, I think yeah. so. Because, you know, and it's only a D8 plus wisdom, but you can do it a number of times equal to proficiency bonus. So it's just this little increase to your number of hit points that makes you that more survivable, mm -hmm. which is significant for things like range rangers that already aren't taking any damage. That's like just even more padding to the don't worry, you'll never die kind of equation. Yeah. If you're melee, Okay, it's a nice little uh, boost and help, but um, but you know, it's just another source of these temporary hit points that I think if anything, what you hear constantly is DM saying, it's hard for me to challenge my party. Mm -hmm. And we're now getting to a situation where temporary hit points are gonna be seen very often if your players are using Tasha's. Mm -hmm. uh, almost across every class, you may have either something that gives everybody temporary hit points or they have a way of self-giving it. Mm -hmm. And that's gonna be an impact that makes it harder and harder for DMs to challenge. So we've just gotten through the first optional feature, uh, Deft Explorer. Now we come to the second optional feature, which is also at first level, and this is called Favored Foe, which replaces Favored Enemy. And they explicitly, ex uh, expressly, explicitly say that it works with the Foe Slayer feature. Um, Favored Enemy in, in, in 3E used to be this massive damage boost, right? Correct. Third edition, yep. I had a ranger there too, and oh, it was just delicious fought in a campaign against giants, just lots of damage. Mm -hmm. um, and then it became, it, it sort of switched over the additions to become more of a tracking and lore device, which is really that is in 5e. It's not particularly useful to get a bonus on tracking things. You know, scenarios have very limited capability for that. It's a, again, a sort of open play thing, but not pretty useful. Yeah. And this comes, we could have a whole discussion and probably have about exploration as a pillar in D&D. <laughs> And, you know, it's sort of the odd person out, redheaded stepchild of the pillars because it's harder to uh, make it work in an adventure. It's, for yeah. some people, the least interesting thing. They love the role playing. They love the combat. This exploration doesn't scratch certain itches for maybe a majority of, of players. So uh, it's, yeah, it's hard it's, to make it work. That's the thing is that I think that it's hard for DMs to know what to do with it. And so when I say, you know, oh, you know, uh, giants destroyed this, you know, caravan that we're finding the remnants of. Cool. I want to track them back to where they came from. And the DM just thinks, oh, you're not supposed to do that. Well, I'm really good at it. Oh, uh, I don't know. Uh, right. You don't find anything. Oh, OK. So glad right. I had that feature on my character. Exactly. It, it's more of a plot thing sometimes, mm -hmm. as you say. So... Well, let's talk about each of the little bullets under this favorite enemy. <laughs> so when you hit a creature with an attack roll, you can call on your mystical bond with nature to mark the target as your favorite enemy for one minute or until you lose concentration as if you were concentrating on a spell. <sighs> right. Immediately. At first, I think, OK, cool. Um it's completely the opposite of what favored enemy used to be, even going back editions, right? Because basically yeah. now you're choosing, oh, this ooze, this ooze is now my favorite enemy. Okay, I guess. 
Yeah, and, and the closest parallel is 4E's Hunter's Mark, right? So in 4E, right. you had a feature that you could use to at will say, that's my mark, I am focusing on you, I will do extra damage. And that got brought into 5th edition as a spell. Correct. And what a lot of us have said is it should have been a feature. Mm -hmm. Because as a spell, it's problematic. One is you only have but so many spell slots, so you have to burn through these spell slots to use it. Two, it's concentration. So you get a hit and you lose it, you have to recast it mm -hmm. and you can lose it again. And if you're melee ranger, it's an entirely different situation than if you're a ranged ranger because you're getting hit all the time and you're gonna lose that concentration and you're not particularly good at your constitution probably. So here we see this, which isn't really so much about favorite enemies. It's kind of more like, again, about the idea of Hunter's Mark. And, but it's sort of, you know, it's it, on one hand, it's better, right? Because um, you now do it not as a bonus action, but when you hit, so you hit a creature, you mark it sort of with this new feature mm -hmm. with your favorite foe. And now you get um, this this damage boost. It gives you an increase of damage by 1d4. Um, and so that part is great. It's a little streamlined, easier to use. But again, concentration. So your melee ranger is still back to that same point of making concentration checks every single time they take damage to lose it. You can use it a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus and then recharge with a long rest. You know, depending on the type of ranger, this can really lose itself over time. Mm -hmm. One good thing I like, the damage scales. It goes to 1d6 at 6th level, which is actually what Hunter's Mark is. Mm -hmm. um, so it's actually behind initially, but then at 1d8 at 14th level. So that part's kind of better, but I, this to me is is a, it's sort of an all over the place design that doesn't acknowledge the problems with either favorite enemy or Hunter's Mark. So I, I find this to be yeah. perplexing, yeah, <laughs> I it, would say. I and, think it it misses its mark if I dare so, yeah, dare say if, so. If you say so. And, even if you're cool with all of all of this, there's still some questions, at least for me when I read this, because so you're concentrating on this ability as if you were concentrating on a spell. Does that mean you are not actually concentrating so that you can cast a concentration spell? It I would assume from... yes. It seems from Jeremy that the answer is that this counts as concentrating on a spell in all rule ways. So that means you cannot cast okay. a concentration spell. And one of the problems rangers have is they have tons of competing concentration spells, yep. especially a bunch of them at first level that all sound awesome. And one of the saddest things is to tell that new ranger player, no, you can't do Hunter's Mark and you also do this other really cool spell. No, no, but don't wait, I'll hit you. Wait and I'll hit you and it'll go away. Right. Yeah. Okay. See, I, I didn't see Jeremy's ruling or Jeremy's uh, instruction or, or uh, yeah. You know. And I agree with you. It's confusing. The as if you were concentrating doesn't actually tell me the words I need to know here yeah. about am I concentrating on a spell for all intents and purposes? The answer seems to be yes, but the text is pretty vague. And this comes up in a couple of places in Tasha's. Yeah. All right. So, okay. I, I will, uh, I will continue to not comment anymore on that uh and you can use this uh marking for a uh, number of times equal to your proficiency bonus and you get expended uses back after a long rest mm -hmm. uh, next are additional ranger spells uh aid magic weapon elemental weapon revivify greater restoration revivify is significant there yeah. Yeah, and those are the ones that I found interesting. To me, one thing is a lot of them had concentration spells. You know, you're gonna, I could go on forever about that. Uh, aid is also, I've said this before, it's a really strong spell, especially when you upcast it, which rangers can't do as easily. But I'm hesitant to see aid show up on so many spell lists because we've talked about all the temporary hit points. Aid increases your maximum hit Excellent. point value. Mm -hmm. So you can throw temporary hit points on top of it. And Aid is already sort of 5e's secret we win spell, where if you cast two high level aid spells, the adventure kind of just generally should not have the damage to kill your party anymore. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's like a math level thing. And, and I hate to even say it because I don't want to see it abused, but when you then throw temporary hit points on top of that through any of these various mechanics, characters really aren't going to be too threatened. And so we're seeing aid in, in this book. We've already seen aid come up on a number of spell lists, and that worries me a little bit. Mm -hmm. At second level, you get fighting styles. 
uh, same as you know we've talked about with the fighter, with the paladin. Uh, blind fighting is an option. Thrown weapon fighting is an option. But there's a new one called Druidic Warrior, where you get two cantrips from the Druid spell list, which count as ranger spells, with wisdom being your spellcasting ability. Uh, and then each time you level, you can replace those uh, cantrips. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I don't know that any of those beat out the the really solid fighting styles that already exist, but uh, it's some options and partly is some fun way. I look forward to seeing someone come up with a druidic warrior that's somehow strangely effective, you know, using shillelagh or something. Or I don't know. Yeah. We'll yeah, see. It, it is. Uh, yeah. It, it will be interesting to see how it's used. Uh, at second level, you also get spellcasting focus, where you can use a druidic focus for your ranger spells, like a sprinkle mistletoe, holly, a rod of you wood, staff, fetish type object, etc. I don't quite understand the point of this. Um, I sort of feel like rangers should be the class that doesn't use a focus at all, right? Because they are often two-handed in their weapon choice. They're either sure. using a bow or double weapons. So I don't know why. I, I don't, yeah, maybe someone else understands the, the purpose of this specifically, but okay. My bow is made of a rod of you. How's that? Yeah, I like okay, it. Okay, there you go. Uh, <laughs> at third level, want, you get... I want to play in your campaign. <laughs> exactly. At third level, you get primal awareness, which replaces primeval awareness, uh, which will uh, let you expend a ranger spell slot to sense certain types of creatures within one to six miles. So that that was always a weird one to me, that primeval awareness. Yeah. So what did they put in this primal awareness to replace it? So instead, they give you a, a pretty big package of spells that you get at various levels that reinforce this idea of being connected to nature without being such a wide open, strange thing. Because the primeval awareness just told you that there are like whatever you're focusing on. Oh, they're undead somewhere within a mile or six miles if it was a favored terrain. So that was there was nothing you could super do with that. Now you get these concrete spells. Uh, speak with animals at third, be sense at fifth, speak with plants at ninth, locate creatures at 13th, and hilariously, because it's a lot like primeval awareness tried to be, commune with nature at 17th. Um, these don't count against the number of spells that you know, uh, and you can cast each one once without expending a spell slot. And of course, more if you do spell, spend a spell slot. All right. I, at fourth level, you get uh, martial versatility. Uh, which is uh, whenever you reach a level that your ability score improves, you can switch out your fighting style. And we've already commented on that and what we think of that. And finally, at 10th level, you get Nature's Veil, which replaces Hide in Plain Sight. Uh, can you tell us about Nature's Veil? I don't even want to talk about Hide in Plain Sight, but you have to start with that, which was the most <laughs> bizarre. Someone watched um, Predator, where Arnold Schwarzenegger covers himself in mud and the predator walks by and doesn't see him and just decide to make that a feature that literally required you to spend like 10 minutes or a, one minute to camouflage yourself and you couldn't move or attack without revealing yourself but you got a plus 10 to stealth while you just sat there in the mud and bark or whatever it was a really strange 10th level feature so now you just literally can turn yourself invisible uh, as a bonus action and it lasts until the start of your next turn it's a lot like the fur bulg racial ability mm -hmm. Um, and uh, that's cool. You can use it a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus, and you gain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. So I'm down with this. Uh, it's just it, to me, it, it is fascinating because it's just so obviously a lot of these things. So obviously, are to me, wizards admitting that old design was problematic mm -hmm. and fell short, which it was. Yeah. Um, and and in some cases, I like the fixes, right? But in other cases, I'm like, oof, I don't know. You know, it doesn't. Doesn't quite get me there. It it kind of goes to show how problematic the ranger itself is. Yeah. Just when you get one shot at it and it doesn't quite come up right, and you take another shot at it and you fix some things, but it still doesn't quite come up right, it might be time to admit that <laughs> the ranger itself is problematic, just the concept. Yeah. And and move in a different direction completely. And the thing is the ranger is a wide enough class between its spells and and how it can attack and, and things like its uh, you know features that do work that it's actually a ton of fun. I mean I, it's the class I've probably played the most uh, certainly in Adventures League play. Um, and can and I'd say I love the ranger despite these various problems because it has enough other stuff that makes it fun. 
but it, it this speaks to how wizards does not want to invalidate something that's in the player's handbook right and, mm -hmm. and the obvious thing to do would be take a second pass at that and really do it differently and i think they've tried to do that sometimes through subclasses what if this subclass fixes some of the problems and here we see these optional features trying to fix some of the core stuff I don't know that we quite are there yet. And, and I, I almost wish that we just really would say, you know what, your player's handbook has a couple of pages that just don't work. Here's the new version of those pages. Mm. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, if we're still on fifth edition 10 years from now, <laughs> Maybe which, we'll see that. which why, would, why would that change? Because yeah. everything's still growing. Uh, well, we'll find out. So I think next week we will look at the two ranger archetypes that are presented in Tasha's, the awesome. Fey Wanderer and the Swarmkeeper. But we want to get to the DM side of Tasha's and begin our look. Hey, there's no spoilers here. We're just talking to DMs in general. So you don't have That's to right. leave anymore like you used to have to leave if you were uh, playing or planning on playing Icewind Dale, Rime of the Frostmaiden. So... What do we talk about first for the Dungeon Master's tools that were presented in Tasha's? Yeah, so they started us off with the most obvious and smart choice for uh, first topic, the Session Zero. So, yes, yeah, Session Zeros. L let's talk about them. Uh, a couple of, couple of things going into that. I have seen people get confused between two terms, Session Zero and Slot Zero. Uh, they, they are they are two completely different topics. A a slot zero is something at a convention where the DMs get together to play an adventure before the convention starts. So uh, slot like slot one would be the first slot of a role playing game convention. So a slot zero is anything that's played before the convention. That has nothing to do with session zeros for a campaign. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and the second thing is this came up maybe two or three weeks ago, maybe a month ago on Twitter, where someone said session zeros are a big waste of time because they're just DMs telling the players this big, long backstory before the campaign starts. That is also not what a session zero is. That might be a small part of it if done very, if done, if done correctly, but that is not what a session zero is. So let's talk about what a session zero actually is. Yeah, and, and they start this section off with a quote from Tasha that maybe is not either what uh, session zero is, but it's still very funny, which says, right. establish boundaries, and if anyone crosses them, speak up. If they don't listen, there's always cloud kill. Right. <laughs> yeah. I think cloud kill here is a metaphor for you walk out of the campaign. Yeah. And that's the whole point is we're trying to prevent a situation like this, right? Where where the game is not fun. And that's what it's all about. And so this section walks us through a number of steps uh, for what the session zero can establish. It has character and party creation, social contract, and game customization. And, and at, at first look, you're thinking, oh, maybe they're not gonna hit sort of the important topics, but they actually do come in and I think do a really nice piece of writing. Hats off to whoever wrote this section, my personal opinion because it really does a nice job of, of, I think, walking a person who might be new to these topics through the benefits of them and giving them some confidence, perhaps as a dungeon master or even as a party member, to be a part of this conversation. Mm -hmm. And I assume what you're talking about here is sort of the safety tools, uh, th that, that sort of yeah, uh, aspect even, of the session zero? Even broader than that, just the idea of being on the same page as to what you want to be, what kind of game you want to have, right? Like, are we slapstick or are we, you know, every person further themselves? Are we heroic? Are we, you know, can I be an evil character? I super love horror and gore, don't you? You know, it's just any mm. number of, of aspects of this that come together to the idea of, of let's talk about what kind of a campaign we want to run. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's break this all down. Uh, in terms of what they present here. So the first uh, aspect of Session Zeros they talk about are the character and the party creation. Yeah, um, and it's a nice way to start it because this is the kind of, I can imagine if you're trying to write this section, you, you kind of bang your head against the wall thinking about how to explain all this. And so this is a nice way to start to say like, okay, we're going to sit down together at this Session Zero before the campaign starts, and we're going to discuss what kind of characters you can make. Like we might restrict some options 
because they're unsuitable for the campaign, right? Maybe I don't want you to be, you know, the new uh, Van Richten's, you know, vampire stuff. I want you to be more humanish, or I, maybe I don't want monstrous backgrounds, things like being a, a knoll or a bugbear. Uh, or maybe I think that's awesome and I want everybody to be a part of that because here's what the campaign is about. So that's a nice way to do that. Yep. It gives the DM a chance to get their vision for the campaign across and it gives the players an opportunity to vet that vision. Um, yep. And that is very important because you don't want to get four sessions into a campaign realize that you know there are some very dark themes in this dm's campaign that you are uh in no shape or have no interest in uh taking part in so all yep. of that can be can be hashed out uh immediately and any uh conflicts between what the players themselves want in the campaign in terms of their characters their backgrounds uh the way they play the game can be uh, hashed out there as well. Yeah, and, and they have, there's some nice uh, advice here. Things like uh, encourage players to choose different classes so the party has a range of abilities. And that seems straightforward, but it's it's a nice guide here that you get on how to plan for the session zero. Or note the backgrounds as it tells you the past you should know about the characters. It's gonna seem really obvious to some, but for somebody starting a first campaign, these are helpful hints. Um, and there's a section on party formation. Um, you know, do you want to assume that they know each other already? Um, it, ask questions such as whether anyone is related. What keeps them together as a party? What does each character like the most about the other characters? Does the group have a patron? Mm -hmm. uh, come up with a story for how you met. And there's a party origin table where you can roll on it. And, you know, a funeral brings the characters together or a festival. Or, mm -hmm. um, so that may be helpful. Um, I think that's one of the questions you, that's always a, a big question is, you know, should the characters know each other when the game starts? We want to have that assumption that they know each other to some extent, or are they brand new? And this seems to push players or, and, and campaigns more towards the idea that they do know each other. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's fine. But if, if you go that route, there's some nice support here. Right. And if you want to play against that type, if you want to play against that understanding that our abilities are all going to meld. If you want six half-orc barbarians as the party, that's cool, but you you know ahead of time that you're not going to be checking for a lot of traps. You're not going to be stealthing all that much. You're not going to have any arcane support uh, whatsoever. And you can have a really fun game that does that, but at least you know ahead of time that that's going to be the case. Yep, totally. Um. Then there's some advice on running a game for one player. And uh, this is a good part where you can kind of work with their backstory, maybe even helping them come, come up with it together. Uh, and then adding a sidekick that complements. So if they're a spellcaster, then maybe the sidekick will be a fighter or a rogue. So some good background mm -hmm. there. And then we get to the topic of a social contract. Yeah, the social contracts are interesting because you know, it, it, you, if you're a a student of just human nature, you understand that life is a social contract. Um, and you, you make these social contracts with pretty much everyone you talk to, whether you sit and think about it or not. Uh, you know, Teos and I, just interacting this way, we've never sat down and said, okay, this is how you're going to work, this is how I'm going to work. But you come to an understanding uh, of, of the, the way things run. So this is something that's always there. And some people think since they are good at uh, dealing with other people that they understand the implicit nature of social contracts that everyone does. Mm -hmm. And that is just not the case. That's okay. why uh, it's a super important to actually discuss it ahead of time rather than just assuming that you know that this person who's coming into your group uh, understands how these social interactions work. Yeah. And there can be a lot of reasons for why players may not have that grounding that uh, some players have or that the DM may want. Um, and so establishing that and those needs uh, is pretty important. So it talks about discussing the experience you want, the topics, themes, and behavior that the group is going to deem appropriate. 
Um, there's some language here that gives you sort of bullet points that you can use, you know, if you were to create a document or if you want to kind of talk to your players, you can almost read out of the book, which is kind of cool, um, on what to provide, fun, uh, tailored for them, every player getting to contribute, um, you will listen to them, things like that. So there's some actual kind of contract information here. Uh, they point out that players will respect you and the effort you take to create a fun game. And players will allow you to direct the campaign. They will allow you to be the arbiter of rules, um, the person who settles arguments, and they'll respect your role. So there's, there's a lot of that on the player side. Uh, and the understanding that at the end of the day, violating the social contract can mean dismissal from the group, right? If, if you're not a fun member of this group, that, that it can eventually lead to you not being a part of the group. And that's an important to understand. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and it's important also, regardless of the kind of game that you're running. So if you are, say, running an adventurer's league sort of campaign with a bunch of players in your area where different players may be dropping in and out, um, it's obviously very important to have that sort of thing. And the, while the Adventurers League does have some rules, they don't have an explicit social contract document that tells every player how exactly to act. Yep. So it's it's important to, for you as a DM, especially as an organizer, to set some ground rules, to set some limits. But it's it's important for you as a player to make clear what is acceptable and what's not to you as well. Um, and make sure that your acceptable, your limits uh, fall in line with what's going on around you. Yeah, and there's a whole section on limits, and they break things down into hard and soft limits. So the idea is that after you have this social contract discussion, you discuss every player's limits, um, you know, what things you, you uh, should think twice about crossing, um, and what things are a hard limit. Um, and I, I had an Adventures League uh, DM recently as part of the virtual weekends that uh, did a good job of sort of explaining where, uh, you know, if you think of in, in part of the Star Wars movie, there's the whole aspect where, um, where Anakin is going to go into the Jedi Temple where all the children are. Mm -hmm. That scene doesn't play out, but right. we know what happens and then we back away, right? And that's sort of like, you know that's an, a good thing a uh, way to think of the limit that we there are times in a game when we could go forth and explain things but when we know that the players just don't want that kind of content right they don't want that kind of scene then they, we back off and and there's just that illusion to it and we move to a, to a different place mm -hmm. um so that's a, a good good way of thinking about these differences between soft limits and hard limits to what extent we're going to talk about it a little bit uh but we're going to stay away from that hard line that you're never going to cross right yeah and i think horror campaigns benefit from this mm -hmm. it sounds like van richten's guide will have even more information yeah. on this topic yep and and there are lists that give you common uh common items that you may want to talk about with your players for hard and soft limits right Viol certain types of violence endangering children right there, there there's the list but then there's also the things that aren't on a normal list that you as a player may have, you know, uh, arachnophobia, <laughs> right? Being an example of even if being having a sp spider described to you uh, freaks you out, then put that on the list, even though th it's not already there. So people will be aware that 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 is a thing for you. Yeah, and there's a, a, there are a number of tools out there that are great to look at. There's the concept of lines and veils that's really helpful. Um, so th I think, you know, this because of the type of book it is, it doesn't sort of send you elsewhere, but it's important for listeners to know that there are a number of great resources you can go out to look at. And there are, as you said, so there are already like spreadsheets that people have made. Um, there are things you can integrate into Roll20 uh, or other virtual tabletops as sort of check boxes or cards. So somebody can throw up a yellow card. Um, there are tools like the X card that you can use in play. So there's a lot you can do to back up the, the guidance that's in uh, Tasha's with actual things that you use at the table or a checklist that you put, you know, what kind of horror do you like? What kind of, you know, scenes do you want to see? And just, you know, when you think about things like, for example, is it fun for an NPC to flirt with your character? Right. 
and we can take that into various different types of flirting and so that's where you end up with this sort of like oh, i might i'm okay with some sure or nope i really don't want any of that yeah and it's, it's and that's well. that's why session zeros are so important so you can get these things out in the open ahead of time and know the limits and know the cutoff points and uh and like as teo said if you just search rpg safety tools you will come up with a ton of tools a ton of discussion on it uh the only bad discussion of it is there shouldn't be any right <laughs> because it's gonna be even if for you it doesn't matter it does matter for other people yeah. um and this is a social game so it's important to keep that in mind and I've been surprised because I, I tend to think of myself as a person that, you know, like, oh, I will roll with it kind of person. Like, I play with a lot of different types of games, you know, it's fine. Uh, but when I've looked at these sort of lines and veils uh, checklists that have been shared with me before different games, I've actually come to realize that, you know, hey, there are a number of cases where it, I'm actually going to have more fun if the DM takes into account these areas where I don't really care to see that, you know, I don't care for excessive gore descriptions is a personal one for me. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, that I'm actually happy if a DM provides me with that kind of a checklist. Right. It can be and, surprising and once you look at it. Yeah, it, it's that's I've found the same thing. I've seen people or heard people say, well, I anything goes with me. I nothing bothers me. You can usually find someone's button. Uh, yeah. if, if you try hard enough. And so, uh, you know, just keep in mind that even even if you are the roughest, toughest uh, ombre in all the land, uh, th there may be something that that uh, you would prefer not to engage with in the game. And right. if, if you're that tough and there's something for you, there's something for everyone. Yeah, and absolutely. The, yeah. And, and the, the last aspect of session zeros that is that is discussed in Tasha's is game customization. So it talks about the shape of the game, not just to the characters, but to the characters tastes. Yeah, this is pretty good advice too. Um, and, and it may be a lot of what folks think of when they think of a session zero, it's um, what kind of campaign does the DM want to run? And what do their players want to run? Like the three pillars, right? Which are everybody's favorite pillars. And it can be really great. I've used tools like um, uh, surveys that I send out even before we meet physically for session zero uh, is actually how I like to do it. So I'll send out a survey and collect results and then I'll discuss it at the session zero so that we can then establish that as a group. And that's where it's fun to kind of say like, hey, most of you really liked combat uh, but you also really like role playing or maybe you're super into exploration um, things like asking what kind of uh, players they are, right? Player types that we've talked about in the past. That can be really interesting. How much humor do you like in the game? Mm -hmm. What level of technology do you enjoy solving in game puzzles and riddles? Right. And and it's not that if someone says no, well, you can never do it, but you just know that you're not going to hit them over the top endlessly with with puzzles and riddles. You're right. going to every now and then have a little piece and you may you're not going to make it the hardest puzzle in the world because most of your players don't like it, according to the survey results. Right. Right. And you can also take that to the level of just logistics for your game. Um, OK, we're going to meet once a week on Sunday evenings. Yeah, you know, it seems pretty cut and dried, but what about if someone doesn't show up? What about if someone came? Are we still going to play? Are we going to play their character or are we going to just have their character be on the sideline for that game? Or do we have a modified stat block version of their character that someone will play? Uh, can anything bad happen to a, someone's character if they're not there and it's being played? Uh, you know, all yeah, of these can... things may, may seem like not a big deal, but they turn into a big deal if a campaign goes on for long enough. Yeah, and, and they're super helpful. Like when I was running Tomb of Annihilation for my session zero, I, I started asking sort of questions about the world. And I got some fascinating things that led to like, okay, they really want to see more about the pirates or, um, you know, the Yuan-Ti could play a big role. But when I started asking questions about like, where are the Yuan-Ti? Most of the characters came back with, actually, I want you to tell me that. Like, I don't want to help build to that level. I want it, the world to be surprising to me and, and, and I want to experience it. I don't want to actually forge it too much. 
And that was itself a really valuable lesson to me. Like, okay, these players, you know, want me to, to give them this experience. They don't want to, you know, place mm -hmm. things on the map and then later find them. Maybe they, they want to find them. Um, yeah. So th there's a lot that comes from these kinds of questions. I think it's an awesome thing to experiment with. Mm -hmm. um, the last topic here they gave us is house rules, which is another one that I think is important. Uh, you know, I always think the guidance that they don't really say here, but I would say is anything for house rules should be a really small list. Mm -hmm. Just like any amount of campaign information you're going to people should be very small initially. You can right. do more later. But um, and, and what I like here about the guidance is they sort of say house rules are best presented as experiments mm -hmm. and time will tell if they're good for your game. And that's a great, great language to, that this gives to you um, because it's a great stance to adopt. Hey, we're going to try this. Right. Here's what I'm thinking of for house rules, but I may change this if it doesn't work out. And that's good for player and DM. Right. And it's always important to give the players the option to say, you know what, even though you DM don't like or love this house rule, it's not working out for us and be open about why be open about why you're incorporating a house rule in the first place, explain what you're hoping to get out of it. Then you can evaluate if it's doing what you want it to do. And the players can help you evaluate if it's doing what you think it, it's, it's supposed to do. Um, and if you're to the point where you're trying to sneak house rules past people, uh, you know, it, it may actually be for the better that you're doing something that the players don't understand because it's making it more fun for them. Uh, but, you know, just be wary, be, be uh, open to really cogitating on why uh, you're using this house rule and what its effect is on your game. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. So that was the session zero portion of the DM's tools of Tasha's. And next week, I think we will probably look at sidekicks, how to use them, what they are, and uh, what they might bring to your game. I mean, I have a lot of experience in this topic. Being your sidekick. You, being your side, being my sidekick. Uh, well, I, I, I think uh, I've been doing a lot of the kicking lately. And you've you've been carrying siding more of the. Yes, I feel like siding at some point. But enough of that madness. Thank you, listeners, and thank you to our patrons. Um, if you enjoy the show and you're not already a patron. You can become a patron by going to patreon.com slash MMP for Misdirected Mark's production. Uh, Teos, social media, what do you think about it? And where can people interact with you on it? I've heard about it. It's unquestionably positive in every way possible. <laughs> uh, but only if you're looking at, uh, at Sean Merwin uh, and at AlphaStream on the Twitters. Uh, you can also find my blog at alphastream.org. Uh, and a great which, blog it is. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I've had some fun recently, and I just started setting up a mailing list on it. So oh, you can now wow. get it delivered straight to your inbox. Nice. You can find me on Twitter at Sean Merwin. Uh, I have no blog. I have no mailing list. But you can talk to me on the Misdirected Mark forums at forums.misdirectedmark.com. And you can follow the podcast on Twitter at Mastering DND. &D. Mastering Dungeons is a misdirected Mark production, the media arm of encoded designs. So, Teos, now that we've discussed the Ranger, and now that we've discussed Session Zeros, what should we do? Let's take a minute and hide, and then we're going to pop out and kill some monsters. Oh, yes. We will, we will kill them in our favorite terrain. <laughs> our favorite terrain. <laughs>